Hello, hello, and welcome to another hometown daily. Well, it's a hometown daily. Season two, episode 145 from May 25th, 2023. And here's a quick rundown of tonight's articles. A marathon wait to return. Oh, wait. Tonight's show is titled Bites and Beaks. Tonight, uh, the articles that we're going to talk about, there's 11 of them. Uh, marathon wait to return. Towers of Agsa. <laughs> Agasba. Sorry. Uh, looks interesting. Arizona Sunshine VR has a bright future. An Android app starts recording after lurking. Twitch is raising turbo price by 50%. Super spreaders of low truthiness. Inverted robust representation. When the fine is cheaper than the profits. AI chat TikTok bot. Nesting for profit. And copium for polluters. Let's get into today's articles. Hey, I'm on the wrong page. But that was the next page. <laughs> Hello, I am Mayor Watt. That is hometown.com, and right up above me is the AI. And we haven't changed your colors in quite some time. I think we need to. Good evening, hometown citizens. How are you doing over there? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing all right, except that my lights aren't on. There. Now they're on. So, uh, we've already selected all of the articles for today. And once again, Twitch says that my connection is unstable. I keep thinking that it's calling me out directly, but... Maybe not. Um, if you're hearing my voice, um, it would be great to hear and see you. So if you would like to come and hang out, we're here at 9 p.m. Eastern every day talking about the news that flows through hometown. Um, you might want to check your um, error messages. Oh, really? Oh, it's okay. But you've got it okay. You you just don't hear me, right? I had somebody confirm it, and it's a problem. Oh, really? Um, hmm. Let me do something here. I guess I'll be leaving all of this in. Inside baseball, I suppose. Okay. Well... We're going to keep moving forward. I'll listen to the playback and see um, what's going on. It might be uh, something else going on that it's actually going out to a Twitch OK and being recorded OK. So let's just keep moving forward and we'll Got cross this bridge. OK, so <clears throat> all of the news that we have today um, it's heavily centered around, well, not all of it. We've got a lot of software based things. So, um, let's get into today's news. If the audio is messed up, then, uh, maybe as time goes on, it'll get better, but there isn't much that I can do because what's going out is perfect. No dropped frames. CPUs barely being touched. <laughs> Um, so it has to be uh, Twitch side. So ah, I'm going to keep okay. on moving forward. Um, Sorry for at the interruption. Any rate, no, that's fine. Um, you know, the AI is supposed to be saving me. Um, so just a little bit to get back on track. The idea for hometown is that you can you can swipe left and right on the show. Uh, or I'm sorry, on the website. So hometown.com, you sign in or sign up, whatever you uh, are up to. Um, if you haven't become a citizen yet, then sign up. If you are a citizen, then sign in. Um, when you first load the page, it tells you now to log in and swipe left to save, right to ignore. It'll go into the correct repository of 
links um, and it'll keep on growing as time goes on if you never want to see the article again um, and I've, and I've got plans for that function so um, yeah it, it should be pretty neat as you use the service anyway um, each show we encourage you to go over to hometown.com slash elections and you can vote for that day's articles you just mash the button you don't actually have to be logged in to mash that button by the way but either way vote let us know that you're interested in a particular topic um okay let's get into the first article so the very first article for today is over in the warcrafters channel uh, Bungie is bringing Marathon back as an extraction shooter. And, and if you're listening to this and my voice is still breaking up, let me know. But um, it seems to have picked up and, it, and should be fine now. Um, so this uh, Marathon game used to be sort of like StarCraft. Um, so Bungie is best known for the studio behind Halo and Destiny. But before it did any of that, it made Marathon, a groundbreaking first-person shooter released in 1994 uh, for the Apple Macintosh. When I looked up Marathon, it did not give me this. There's another game out there called Marathon, um, as far as I know. Well, anyway, um, then I read this, and I'm like, huh, I'm really curious what this is all about. I haven't seen it. Um, the studio made the surprise announcement that Marathon is coming back, but it won't be quite the same as it was 30 years ago. A massive ghost ship, this is a quote, and the backstory, the world building for this game. Um, a massive go ghost ship hangs in low orbit over a lost colony on Tau Seti 4. And every time I think of that, I think of the Wrath of Khan, Seti Alpha 6. No, it's Seti Alpha 5! And people being controlled by little earworms. Anyway, the Marathon website says this, um, setting the stage for the game's narrative backdrop. The ship actually looks like it's punched itself through a moon, though, not just in low orbit. I, I don't know. Maybe it's a different way that it's being described. I don't know. Well, maybe on the next page it'll say something about it. The 30,000 souls who call this place home have disappeared. So let's go over to PC Gamer. Andy Chalk is the author. Um, and I might have actually convoluted a couple of um, games together. So let's we're going to play this video, um, but I won't be able to play it with audio because I'll probably get a takedown. Um, Andy Chalk uh, is the author of this over at PCGamer.com. And uh, the deck says... A revival of Bungie's first big shooter was unveiled at today's uh, PlayStation Showcase, which is not the state of play, folks. That's a different thing. Um, <clears throat> so it says here, Marathon is now an extraction shooter in which players compete for survival, riches, and renown in a world of evolving persistent zones where anyone or any run can lead to greatness. So I'm going to pause this and we're going to watch and I'll describe and maybe the AI will too, uh, what's going on. So uh, when we first start talking about this, um, you're basically presented with this glowing green mushroom. And that's a steady thing throughout the video is this kind of glowing green, whatever it is. Um, and It's basically just smash cut after smash cut. Oh, I'm right. Yeah. So, and then it smashes over to this moon that has a ship blowing right through. It had already blown into this moon, um, breaking off a huge fragment of it and, and wedged inside it. And it just has this stuff and like a, a real broad discordant mess of scenery but it's all centered around somebody running and then getting just wiped out <laughs> um, by a sniper that has kind of like a 
what's the right is do they is it still referred to as hold on a second let me make sure um because i don't know if it's actually called that anymore yeah right yeah it is kabuki a classical form of japanese theater mixing dramatic performance with traditional dance and um, this sniper basically has that kind of face makeup on let's see if i can zoom back to it um and to me it looks like it's gonna be fun but i, I just don't know um the the colors the world building the 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 nature of this looks like it was prepped cinematics not actual gameplay and maybe at the beginning of this it actually says that it isn't actual gameplay but if it's this fast this clean right there's there's no jerkiness there the the people look like they're grounded in that world um and not hovering over it or sliding as they run everything looks like it's perfectly synced right then it's it, definitely noticeable compared to some other games we've shown yeah, um, I I kind of dig this. Uh, this this might be you know I keep talking about my forever game, right? Kind of like my forever home. Um, I I've been looking for a first person shooter one that I think would have legs that I'm actually gonna like, where the the resolution, the colors, the world building, all of that is all really cool. Um, but I just I've never found one that it always tends to kind of devolve into uh, people being tools. Uh, so I don't know. Um, <clears throat> before I get too far into this, let me throw this into the chat. So that's where you go to uh, vote. And this is the first article. Um, I, and I haven't made the elections, these URLs yet, so they will in time, but just not right now. Um, probably next week, along with a, f a few other things that are going to be deployed next week. Hopefully not causing the same problem that we had the last time. So it seems like it's going to be a fun game. Um, so I, I wish that I could show you the original that I saw. Um, I, but I wasn't prepared for showing you the original or the uh, what was the thing that I had seen, which was more like StarCraft than um, what they were talking about as the original first-person shooter back in 1994 on Apple Macintosh, of all things. What a Yeah, pivot. that sounds a bit dated, doesn't it? 1994? Yeah. Well, yeah. no, I meant the Apple Macintosh, but... <laughs> oh, oh, Apple Macintosh, oh, yeah. That's what I fixated on, sure. Yeah, that... I'll just move on. Too much dead air. So, um, yeah, it, it it's basically Halo or Destiny kind of merged together, higher resolution, first-person shooter, extraction shooter. You have to go and do something get your stuff and then get out um, and you might die in the process and lose all of your loot for that particular run. Um, seems like it'll be fun. So I hope that it comes out sooner than later. Um, it's going to come out for, let me scroll down here. It'll be, uh, it has no release date, which basically means 2025, I think, um, maybe late 2024, but, um, so it's supposed to be developed for PC, Xbox Series X and S, um, and PlayStation 5, and will feature full cross-play and cross-save functionality so you can move wherever you want. Start playing it on Xbox, move over to the PC, grab your save, play it on the PC, go to somebody's PlayStation 5, log in, grab your save. Pretty, pretty neat. And that's reason enough to get it. Yeah, if you're into console, but PC. Let's go on to the next article.
So the next article is in the Warcrafters channel. It says the title is okay. I'll play this open world settlement builder that's got sky whales, rideable mice, and Lynx glider. I really wish that they didn't connect it to Lynx glider because now I can just see Nintendo suing the developers of this because it's too close to IP. There's a lot going on with the announcement trailer for Towers of Ag. Agazba, Agazba. One more time, Marwat, Agazba. Like, a lot. A tribe has returned to their homeland to find that it's a wasteland, and uh, which is a huge bummer, according to the author. But for a ruined world, it looks like it's an interesting one. So I'm going to go straight on over to... Actually, I'm going to copy it and throw it into chat. There you go, folks. And then I'm going to go over to PC Gamer. And... Um, so the article's over at PCGamer.com. Christopher Livingston is the author. And it says here, Towers of Agazba. As one of the more interesting open worlds that the author has seen in a while and lots of ways to explore it. So I'm going to hit play. I've already muted it. And uh, we'll talk about it a little bit. So again, the scene opens up to this just brilliant color great resolution, the depth of the visual stage is just spectacular. Great verticality, has a storyline that's brewing. Looks like, <laughs> it looks like a survival, open world survival game, base builder, where you chop down your own trees and put up your own structures. Um, but this one has, like you put up the structure, but it's a big block structure, but the verticality is huge. I love everything that I am seeing. What yeah, I, I want to see the underwater portion, though. <laughs> but look at that. They're very grounded in the real world. And by real world, I mean the ver it's... The characters are actually like pushing off of the ground when they take a stride. They're not sliding along. They're not hovering a couple inches above it. The person that the the, the protagonist in the game, I, I suppose, you, your character. I don't know if it's customizable, um, but they just hopped on some mouse, maybe giant rat. I don't know. Um, and they're riding it through a bunch of other animals and they're cutting through the brush and you can actually see it kind of cutting through the brush, not just, um, it kind of, as you're running, it just seamlessly flows through you. They're actually pushing it out of the way. It's, it's quite neat how they did this. Um, and again, the resolution looks great, but I swear it always feels when it looks this good, it looks like it's cinematics, not in game play, not even staged in game play. You know, um, I want to see more. I want to see the deep water um, swimming. I want to see, I just want to see more. So <clears throat> it's one of those things where we don't know when it's actually going to end up coming out, but um, they say sometime in 2024 that it's coming to Steam. The Steam page isn't active, according to the article. I haven't looked yet, um, but there is an official site. Huh. Um, at any rate, building in this one isn't like block by block. It appears that you're going to be able to put down entire buildings but they're full height buildings like you would actually see being built block by block. These are just a chunk and they're down. Um, by the way, it is now on steam and it says eight hours ago. So I don't know if that's when it was first posted. Um, oh, but it just says coming soon. Oh, right. Okay. Let me see real quick. Oh yeah. Look at that. Um, yeah, maybe they just dropped some update or something over there. So add to your wish list and let them know that you're interested in it. I certainly am. Um, I'm, it's starting to become 
kind of a regular thing like oh maybe this will be my forever home how many games are on your wish list i'm a little worried (laughs) uh right now 140 okay well maybe there's one in there (laughs) but i use it as my watch list not just a wish list Um, it lets me know when games drop um okay pretty neat i think that we'll be checking it out um not this summer but (laughs) here's hoping let's go on to the next article Um, This article is over in the Reality Hacker um, channel, and that's because it's based on VR. Uh, Classic VR zombie shooter Arizona Sunshine uh, has a sequel revealed uh, for PSVR 2 and PC VR during the PlayStation Showcase yesterday. Yeah. Uh, Vertigo Games unveiled the sequel to its classic zombie shooting adventure, Arizona Sunshine. Based on what I see, it's almost like night and day. The, the the graphics are more clear. It's richer. Um, but everybody that I know that played Arizona Sunshine liked Arizona Sunshine up until a point. Um, that point was always different with different people. But uh, dubbed Arizona Sunshine 2, the game appears to have taken a page out of Fallout 4's a book by including a four-legged pal named Buddy who seems to be eager to, as ever, to help out in the wasteland. Um, yeah, you get a dog. So let's go over to Road to VR. And Scott Hayden is the author of this. And I'm going to hit play and mute it. And uh, we'll talk about this. So... Uh, and we talk about it because there's a podcast. This this show is also a podcast. So, um, basically, it looks like somebody is in a trailer of some kind, of a vehicle of some kind, um, and there's zombies. And I've seen this before because I watched the show, the, the PlayStation Showcase. Um, he keeps talking about Fred, and all of the zombies are basically Fred. And um, it shows various scenes where you're in like a trailer park or a strip mall or all kinds of stuff. It's pretty bloody and gruesome, but that's what a zombie game really is. This genre is just kind of blood and guts. So the AI probably is not going to be. This wouldn't be on my wish list, (laughs) but I'm sure it's appealing if you like zombie games. Yeah, but this the thing about this, the real draw, is that it's a zombie game in VR, so you really do get immersed in it, um, and there are, it's a lot of fun um, because you don't have that third-person view, like over the shoulder. Um, you're, you're literally in it, so if you don't look in a direction, you won't ever see what's coming for you. Um, and this exactly. is available now <laughs> um, to wish list, so. Um, It's pretty neat. I I mean, I kind of dig this stuff. So this is already on my wish list. Um, Let's see if there's anything else in here. It says, Welcome back to Sunkiss Zombified Arizona, narrated by unmistakable quips of our dark-humored protagonist, Arizona Sunshine 2, sets you on an all-new limb-strewn adventure in search of answers. In a post-apocalyptic world where every bullet counts, experience the thrill of realistic combat as you wield all new and fan-favorite weapons, from shotguns to machetes. I like saying machete like that. Um, And flamethrowers. And what's better than braving the end of the effing world? Surviving it with your new best friend, Buddy. Not only is Buddy your four-legged companion through thick and thin, he's also the goodest boy and will... Help take down those pesky Freds for you. In a desolate world, suddenly you're not so alone anymore. It's funny how things go. (laughs) So there are trailers over here at Road to VR and some more information if you are so inclined. Um, You can go over to um, the site and click the links to go. It'll forward you over to PlayStation and Steam to mark it as your favorite. 
Uh, but in the meantime, let me throw that into chat as well. There you go. Okay. Did you want to, you know, watch that video a couple more times? I think we can move to the next article because I was thinking, I'm not into zombie games, but I'm really not into zombie VR games <laughs> <laughs> because they're that much more terrifying. <laughs> Um, okay. But well, I can see that would be appealing because I think that's a much different thing than a non VR zombie game. Yeah, I'll have to construct some virtual virtual reality classes for the AI to virtually peer through. Virtually. Virtually, literally, virtually. So the next article is over in the Late Night Geeks channel. Um, an Android app suddenly starts recording users almost a year after it was listed on Google Play. So a little bit about this. Um, apps can get updated, but they're supposed to go through their audit every time they get updated. Um, I don't know what the situation is with this, but it says an innocent seeming apps can be Trojan horses for your information. An Android recording app called iRecorder Screen Recorder began as an innocent screen recording app, but turned evil nearly a year after it was first released, as detailed by Ars Technica. We got this from The Verge. The app first came out in September 2021, but after an update the following August, it began recording a minute of audio every 15 minutes and forwarding those recordings through an encrypted link to the developer server. The whole thing oh, is wow. documented. <laughs> the That's whole thing not is creepy documented. at all. No, it's not. No, it's not creepy at all. Um, so it's documented in a blog post by Essential Security. So let's go over to The Verge and talk about it. So this is why I I don't like the idea of a third party app store because if the security apparatus isn't in place to audit the source code audit what it's doing yeah so Wes Davis it says here a weekend editor who covers the latest in tech and entertainment and has written news reviews and more as a tech journalist since 2020. Uh, smartphone apps can change their behavior well after you download them, turning a once innocent seeming app into something much worse. That's creepy. So it recorded a minute of audio every 15 minutes. And then forwarded it. The recording itself is bad enough, but um, yeah, I don't know. And so again, how long did it take until it was discovered? Well, apparently it's been doing it since the September 2021, no, the August 2021 update. Uh, but it was just discovered by, uh, well, not even just discovered. The whole thing is documented in a blog post. Oh, yeah. 523 2023 is when they posted. From That's East a Central. lot of recordings. Yeah, a, a lot, a lot, because it's a lot coming from one person, let alone everybody. Right, involved. exactly. Like a lot every uh, day times the number of users. Yeah, so research, security researcher Lucas Stefanko um, for Essential Security wrote this whole investigation up. In the post, Stefanko said the app was uploaded in August 2022 to include malicious code uh, based on the open source AWM um, Myth Android Rat remote access Trojan. Um, the app had 50,000 downloads by the time it was reported and removed from the Play Store. Stefanko added that apps with AWM um, Myth embedded in them had made it past Google's filters before. So, oh, and that's the security blogger, right? It's not yeah. somebody with the Google store. No. Um, and there's a link here that you can follow um, to a site called welivesecurity.com. 
And uh, yeah, just I love it when people are really into a particular topic um, because it's just a, a level of depth and dedication that I, I just won't ever reach. So um, it's always awesome to find people that are really into it. So let me throw that into the chat as well. So there you go, folks. If it may be pulled from the store, by the way, uh, but not off of your device. So if you have the iRecorder screen recorder, um, you'll want to um, hunt it down and, and delete it if it's on your device. At least on the Android side, the iRecorder screen recorder has gone bad. Yeah, that's that's beyond bad. <laughs> so this particular app is gone, but what's to keep another sleeper agent from activating on your phone? Google is at least working on updates that will tell you via monthly notification which and when apps have changed their data sharing practices if it finds out that is yeah and that's after it has whatever 15 minute uh <laughs> recordings for a month or a year no or, it or was... later when they don't discover it right <laughs> yeah i mean it had been doing it it was updated in august 2022 to include the malicious code at 50,000 downloads by the time it was reported and removed from the App Store. I'm curious how it was actually detected, but you'll have to go to the Amith, or sorry, not Amith. You'll have to go to the... Um, evolving Threats, I think. The, oh, no, Essential yeah. Security Against Evolving Threats. Yeah, so it's called ESET, Essential Security Against Evolving Threats. So I think people know it by Essential Security. Anyway, or ESET. Um, okay, so there you go, folks. Go and hunt down your, go check, go audit your apps on Android. Let's move on to the next article. So this next article, we'll be quick about it because, well, it's basically stating what is uh, coming to Twitch. This is in the Late Night Geeks channel. Twitch is raising the price of Turbo. It's a monthly subscription that remove ads. It's going from eight ninety nine to eleven ninety nine. That's so. a pretty high percentage increase. Yeah, I mean it's going from nine to to twelve, so it's a thirty three percent increase. I I think I said fifty percent, but I I just derped. At any rate, uh, Twitch is raising the monthly price of Twitch Turbo. It's a monthly service that lets you pay to remove most ads. Uh, no. I haven't seen an ad from Twitch, so I don't know what ads it's not removing. Um, Maybe hmm. ads for Twitch itself or something? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, gives you additional emoticons and more in the U.S. and many countries. In the U.S., it's jumping from 9 to, to 12. I'm rounding up a penny. Um, and you can see prices for other countries in a support article. Yeah, I received a couple of emails uh, because I have two different accounts. Um, one for Ohm Town and one for Mayor Watt. Um, let's see what else is in here. Yeah. I was notified today. So let's go over to The Verge. And Jay Peters is the author of this. They have um, locality-based fees. So if you're in a different country that has a different exchange rate, the price is different. Um, but it's not just exchange rate. It's the economics of that particular country or region. Um, oh. So not everybody pays $8.99. Some only pay, you know, $5.99 or something like that. Um, but I haven't, haven't looked into this in a long time, so I don't really recall all of the differentials. Um, Let's see what else might be in this. Price hike comes on the heels of Twitch getting a new CEO and cutting jobs amidst broader layoffs at Amazon. And it seems that Twitch sees an opportunity to make more money by making Turbo more expensive. While Twitch didn't 
introduce new features on Thursday. It sounds like Turbo will be getting improvements in the future. There are more updates on the way for Turbo to make even more, to make it even better and more relevant to our community. And we can't wait to share them in the coming months. So with the, basically the dying off of market, uh, of um, advertising markets, they're raising the price for people who are really interested in not having ads to begin with. Um, like I have Turbo because I don't like ads. I like to watch the streamers playing a game or talking without um, it cutting to commercial. Uh, it's frustrating as hell because it, it puts a chill. It kills the, the, the story. It, it stops everything. It pulls you out of the environment because suddenly you have some ad blaring in your ear. Um, that's just not part yeah, of the... Go ahead. I didn't, I didn't think about that. Like if somebody's gaming or something, um, I could see where... It, I mean, it's very ridiculous in a TV show or something where there's an unexpected ad that's not like a scheduled one. Um, but gaming might be worse than that. Like in conventional broadcast television, cable television as well, um, shows were planned with breaks. Exactly. And, and then um, streaming started. And the way that it worked was, <laughs> and I can tell you from experience um, with, uh, whatchamacallit, who was the satellite company? Oh, uh, Dish? Yeah, so, not Dish, the... Uh, it was um oh direct tv sorry yeah direct tv direct tv um when it became an early adopter of streaming and it was using the internet to stream direct tv um i was an early adopter of it and a show would be playing and they would cut in with an ad and when you actually when the ad's done the show never stopped. It was the ad right on top. So you would sit there and watch two minutes of ad only to find out that you missed a segment of discussion between two characters. Uh, eventually, they completely wet the bed with all kinds of stuff. Um, and I've moved on uh, from them. And um, that's kind of what happens when a viewer is watching somebody play a game and it cuts to an ad. And then when it cuts back, you're sitting there going, what happened? Oh, the protagonist died. Great. Anyway, if you can swing it, then Twitch Turbo is great because you don't have any ads anymore. I'm going to be livid if ads suddenly start getting injected into the streams regularly, even with Twitch Turbo. Um, well, right. You know, I mean, because then what are you paying for? Yeah. Plus, it it's, for some, it's disrupting your experience. And uh, at the very end of the article, it says, for some, the price of Turbo has decreased. If you live in a place where that's the case, to take advantage of the lower price, you'll have to cancel your subscription and then resubscribe, to which wrote in an email. Um, but time it well. Don't do it after the price goes back up. Well, it's month to month, so it's always going to go up. Eventually, it'll always go up. You really don't even have a choice either. I don't think you... I think if you... You might be able to... The email said something about three months. Um, like you can... Because um, you can have current rates locked in for three months, according to the article. Right. Yeah, it says it up here. Yeah, if you don't renew within the next three months, your Turbo subscription will stop renewing on August 31st. Though your benefits may extend into September, depending on your sub renewal date. Yeah. All right, folks. Let's go on to the next. So, this next article is over in the Mobile Channel and um, sourced from fizz.org. Top Fibbers, F I B E R S. Uh, dashboard tracks super spreaders of low credibility information online. <laughs> I loved this. 
So when it was submitted, I said, yeah, we got to talk about this. Social media super spreaders. The COVID. I keep thinking media. like COVID. Exactly. I guess that's the intent. <laughs> the Maybe it's worse. It's like the Ebola of. Well, right, right. <laughs> because that's a whole lot messier. Um, social media super spreaders have the ability to rapidly disseminate information regardless of its veracity because they're idiots. Um, this means that they can influence consequential inf uh, conversations for better or worse related to elections, public health, and social issues. Um, I've talked about this, but not had the scientific background for it. These people at Indiana University um, put a dashboard together, and now i got to go look at the dashboard. They actually have a, a little example of it, top fibers, F-I-B-E-R-S. The top fibbers, um, and it's not that this is an acronym for something probably in the paper. Um, it's a dashboard that tracks and reports on the top 10 super spreaders of low credibility information on Twitter and Facebook each month. Gateway Pundit is number one. Zero Hedge is another. Uh, NFSC underscore hag news <laughs> is the number three. It's interesting, though, because Gateway Pundit is just, like, crushing the competition. Exactly. I mean, it seems like that's the one to focus on. If they're going to try to crack down on it. Yeah. With the goal of tracking super spreaders that are disseminating large quantities of low credibility content, Indiana University Observatory on Social Media, or OSOME, has launched a new tool, the Top Fibbers Dashboard. Still not right, right? I mean, if it's fibbers, it should be B, right? F I B. Correct, fibers. but it's an uh, it's, it's an false information broadcaster. Right. So, this dashboard provides monthly reporting highlighting or reports highlighting the top ten super spreaders of low credibility information on social media. I love this thing. Um, and so, the fib index refers to the false information broadcaster index. And uh, if you're a, a fibber, this thing is tracking you. I'm really curious how they do it because it's all about verifying the statements that they're making. So it's kind of like a Snoop's back end with artificial intelligence, maybe. I don't know. Um, well, right. How are they even identifying the sources to begin with? And then how are they tracking? Are they just reading all their um, posts or whatever? Can you imagine that? That would be like a criminal investigator having to look at really horrible things to verify that that person was doing horrible things. You'd get PTSD by the time, you know, your 30-day right. stint as an investigator rolls around. So research from our observatory and others has shown that um, a few influencers are responsible for a large proportion of low cred credibility content being shared online, including harmful content such as false vaccine claims. Um, the new dashboard will help citizens understand the role of these bad actors in the spread of misinformation. But you have to be a willing participant. You know, you have to sit there and go, you know what I want to look at? I want to find out if that person has low credibility. But the people that believe this stuff, they're not interested in something that challenges their preconceived notions. No, and are they even asking that question? Probably not. They, yeah. I don't know. So the director of Osomi, I guess, um, and Luddy, Distinguished Professor of Informatics and Computer Sciences, Filippo um, Munkser, or Menkser, sorry, M-E-N-C-Z-E-R. Um, they're the one that have, has been making these statements in, in this article. And um, it uses a definition of misinformation. Let me, I've had either too much or too little caffeine today. That so, was low credibility dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> no, not low credibility. No. I was just trying to play off of that. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. Um, so Osami uses a definition of misinformation commonly utilized in academic research, which focuses on sources of information that mimic news media content in form, 
but not an organizational process or intent. Using this definition, the dashboard searches for posts that contain at least one link to any source that meets three criteria, rated to have low credibility, categorized as either conspiracy, pseudoscience, or questionable slash fake news, and labeled as having a low or very low factual score, and the ratings are curated by an independent third party, media bias slash fact check, and compiled by iffy news. Uh, if he <laughs> news. I so, know of at least one news organization that should have its name be if he news. <laughs> and I think it has an F in its name. Um, so since the sources credibility rating can change, awesome. Me updates its list of sources each month before releasing a new top fibbers report. Um, I will be following this uh, because this is, Basically, every day, all day, this is what I do as well. Um, I look at the sources. I read claims. Um, I'm re if I'm reading a research paper, I look at what the resources are, who paid it. I do a deeper dive investigating who wrote it, uh, what the topic was, its relation to funding, which organizations funded it, um, the outcomes based on other research that exists. and. Um, and well, then, and who did they even um, contact as sources? I don't mean by name, but remember that the fake hotel news story, they didn't even talk to the hotel in the story, for instance. Right. Um, and when I'm talking about it, I, it's more on the academic side. So, yeah, no, I know. Um, and then for news, I actually use other sources to verify that the ones that are being aggregated into Omtown um, meet a certain level. Um, but that level is based on context, uh, not really everything. It's just certain articles will be accepted. Certain topics will be accepted. At any rate, um, I would suggest following this link and going through hometown over to the source. Of course, you can always go straight to the source. Um, just do a search for fizz.org and um, top fibbers dashboard and you'll find it. Um, we just consolidate stuff and then we talk about it each day at 9 p.m. Eastern. So hope you enjoy the show. We've, we're about halfway through, so let's keep on walking down this road. So the next article is uh, over in the Law Nerd channel. And this is what caused me to make the statement inverted robust representation. So an attorney's objective is to provide you with a robust defense. I, um, or uh, offense, really. I mean, it depends on <laughs> which side of the, I guess, the table you're on. Um, and, and so in this particular instance, it says here, it takes a skilled lawyer to negotiate from community service up to jail time. <laughs> what the heck? Uh, going on this here? is a great headline. So talk about no church for the wild and that I don't even understand the context of. So let's go over to above the law. Chris Williams is the author. Um, Sorry, I, I, I need to activate something here real quick. Um, the image is usually a lawyer trying to prevent their client from going to jail, not a lawyer choosing jail over community service. All right. Uh, don't worry. This isn't a story of ineffective counsel. Jail time over cleaning up trash or organize, organizing a philanthropy event was this lawyer's choice for herself. Really? Really? I feel like we're missing something here. So they had a choice between jail time or cleaning up uh, trash or organizing a philanthropy event. I mean, that seems kind of like an obvious choice among those, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if it was me, I would organize the philanthropy event. So would I. Not, uh, I mean, even if you wanted to consider this being a selfish mechanism, right? 
you get all of these people with money, you might pivot them to be a client. Right. I wasn't even thinking about it from that standpoint because it's supposed to be philanthropy. Yeah, exactly. But you don't have to get your hands dirty. Like it seems like even though it'll be probably a lot more work, it might be more appealing than cleaning up trash. But getting your getting not clients, but getting associates to reach out to people and say, hey, I'm putting together a philanthropy event for you know this cause. But I guess <laughs> I, I guess jail time is good. So Wisconsin lawyer. Is it that lawyer? Yes. Yeah, Stephanie Rapkin. OK. Well, yes. When I saw that photo, when you first opened up the article, I went. Um, <laughs> I thought this was for a client, not for the attorney. A Wisconsin lawyer chose jail over community service Tuesday for spitting on a black teenager during a 2020 protest. <laughs> this isn't even the person that I would want representing me, you know? Right. So Shorewood, Wisconsin lawyer Stephanie Rapkin, 67, rejected a sentence of a year probation and 100 hours of community service, uh, report the Milwaukee Journal, Sentinel, Fox 6, and WISN. Damn. Wherever this is coming from. uh, Okay, so this is highlighted text, right? This is from somewhere else, I assume. But Chris Williams... Uh, Chris Williams put down this, right? And then this is from somewhere else. I don't know. It it has to come from one of these right, sources I mean, or all of them. Uh, I don't know how this is actually constructed. Like, what is the source of this? Right. Anyway, um, the report came from three different organizations. As a result, she was sentenced instead to 60 days in jail. Two months in jail. Yeah. That silence is stunned <laughs> internal analysis. Exactly. Trying to figure out what is going on here. They were convicted of misdemeanor disorderly conduct in April, despite her testimony that she spit toward, but not on then 17 year old protester, Eric, Eric Lucas, the third, The incident happened in 2020 and was caught on video. (laughs) Uh, I would have tucked my tail. First off, I would never in a million years do this. Um, I don't care how pissed off somebody might get me, you know, riled up during a protest. First off, I I, odds on I wouldn't be at a protest. I was going to say I'd walk away if I didn't want to hear what the protest was about, but I might actually support the protest depending on what it is. Yeah. I would be on the other side of the, this is the person that would spit on me because I would be on the right right side of the protest. (laughs) So (laughs) this is, this is the, uh, I don't even know what to call that kind of a defense. You know, the wind caught it and it blew onto the person. Anybody who's even thinking about spitting on another person, even if there aren't other issues, which it seems like there are from the article, that person's in the wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah. So in the video, um, someone says that uh, Wisconsin attorney. So here is said video and there's a link. Wisconsin attorney, Stephanie Rapkin, she parked her car to block a a protest through a white suburban area, then spit on a (laughs) minor. Oh, from Rogelio, I guess is their name? Uh, Garcia, a lawyer, um, on June 9th, 2020. Um, So it's really odd that basically she did a lawyer Karen combo which is really never a good combination (laughs) to try and block a protest through a neighborhood with a car in the 21st century as if people wouldn't be motivated enough to just climb over the car or go around it it's not a a star trek uh, force field that you can't you know just move over two feet and go around it So the person says, 
uh, that they harp on this because it brings to mind Amy Cooper, the woman known for choking a shelter dog and trying to call a death by cop on a bird watcher in Central Park when deciding on whether to press charges on her for harassing a dude who wanted to see pretty things fly. The prosecutor decided to drop them on account of apparently therapeutic course on racial bias. <laughs> this is all all kinds of weirdness. There's quite a bit more in this article. Um, well, it looks like Rapkin has had other incidents too. Uh, there's just, I don't know what is going on here. Just unhinged. It's, uh, it says here, your honor, nobody wants me. Rapkin said, I can't leave my house because of the death threats. Nobody wants me to volunteer. I've tried for the past year just to have my own, just for my own mental health. She said she would rather go to jail right now and to take care of it. And Rapkin left the courtroom in handcuffs. Well, that's because you apparently on film spit on a 17 year old during a protest where you actively engaged in trying to block the protest. Now, we have laws that stop people from doing assaults on other people. And when you assault somebody and in the process and with the outcome of assaulting somebody you actively went towards the cause of action you made this you manifested this because people were expressing their right to assemble their right to uh speak against the their first amendment rights to protest and assemble I mean, is there any irony in that, given that she's an attorney, an attorney who, of all people, should at least recognize that? How does she have a law license? How does she have a bar I, card? She won't have one going forward. Huh. Maybe she doesn't. I mean, we don't even know what her status is. Yeah, it doesn't say anything in here about that, does it? No. no. Fascinating. Um. But obviously, I mean, if you're unhinged enough to go into a protest, you're anti that protest, and you actually spit on somebody, I don't care if they say anything. I don't care if they point at you. If they touch you, it's assault. We have laws, and you're supposed to be the representative of those laws in a courtroom, but you're only supposed to be doing it in a courtroom. You're not the one that's supposed to enforce the legality of actions outside of the courtroom. You're supposed to defend people or prosecute them. But unless you're an officer. Go ahead. Sorry. I just tried to find information. Assuming she's admitted in Wisconsin because she could be admitted in another state. She doesn't show up. Oh, interesting. Uh, assuming I got the, oh, it's Rapkin. Sorry. I thought okay. it was Ripkin. Oh yeah. R-A-P-K-I-N. Okay. My fault. No worries. I will just have to, oh, you know what didn't happen? I didn't play the outro or the intro either. Doggone it. So apparently she's in good standing. <laughs> According to the information on the public state bar uh, website. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Okay, um, I'm going to try something and see if it actually activates this. If it does, I'm I'm sorry, folks, but I'm going to do it. Okay, I didn't do it. Um, so we've spent enough time talking about this person. I I don't think that they should have a license, but that's okay. Although, I mean, they controlled themselves since then and before that. They had at least three incidents listed in the article, though. Yeah, so. I don't I'm know wrong. about that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, I guess the law will catch up to you eventually. Let's move on to the next article. So this next article is over in the mobile channel. And this is the one where I said, um, when the fine is cheaper than the profits. Um, so it's in the mobile channel. Shell paid a $10 million fine to restart a Pennsylvania plant that is bound to keep polluting. Shell agreed to pay 
for breaching emissions limits at a plant in Pennsylvania, but not to stop polluting. <laughs> this article's because over. Because who would want to do that? Right. Yeah, it doesn't make economic sense. You have to poison the earth to make profits. So, and and when the fine is less than the profits, then all you have here is margin. <laughs> right. It's almost like a nuisance rather than an actual penalty. Right. It's basically just, it's the tip, right? Like, Hey, I'm going to eat all of this food and here's the tip. So shall acknowledge the plant breached emissions limits and we'll keep doing so in the coming months. <laughs> that's what the, that's what the deck statement says. Something seems wrong with that statement, but okay. <laughs> I'm not sure how to pronounce the person's name. I apologize, but I am trying. Uh, Anania Bhattacharya um, is the author of this over at Quartz or QZ.com. Um, they have a bunch of other stuff. Um, I don't know if they've always... I remember these as uh, from a different site, but anyway... Um, this is a fairly new um, source that we aggregate. Again, we only grab that little bit um, and it's actually provided by the website. It's not, it's not uh, scraping. Scraped from or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so it says here, Shell has agreed to pay for breaching emissions limits on a plant in Pennsylvania, but is not going to stop polluting altogether. Apparently, according to the press release from Pennsylvania governor, Josh Shapiro's office yesterday shall formally acknowledge that the company exceeded total emission limitations on air contaminants, agreed to make repairs to reduce future exceedances, and agreed to pay nearly $10 million to the Department of Environmental Protection and the local community for violations at its vast petrochemical facility in the Potter and Center Townships, Beaver County, according to to, um, it says Quartz contacted Shell for comment. So let me pause this real quick because I don't think it has anything to do with the article. Um, but after about five years of construction, the refinery located just over 30 miles west of Pittsburgh finally kicked off operations in November 2022. And almost immediately, the plant that cracks uh, ethane to produce polyethylene, which is, I think, the stuff that got dumped out of the train. Um, a practice that is criticized for raising emissions and discourages uh, use of recycled plastics drew ire from residents and environmentalists alike. What? So yeah, I, I oh, don't know PE. what that's about. So for the for plastic, I don't think you can recycle it as easily for this type of plastic polyethylene plastic oh i see and by um, the way the other thing was like polyvinyl chloride i think that too yeah yeah okay so maybe not uh pe but um maybe we can dig around i don't know anyway um horrible chemicals all the same but we all have to you we don't have to but we don't have any other options in some cases you, if you want a product or a service, this might be the product that is incorporated in the other product that you actually need or use. Um, so you have to be very aware. And if you become, um, there's different alignments. So if you become like fanatically ethical about something, you'll just never consume anything because when you peel back the layers, that lead you to the origin of said product, there's always an abuse somewhere in that chain, unless you are farming it and putting it all together by hand, you yourself. And then even then somebody's going to ride you about the fact that you're not getting permission from the sheep that you're shearing. So, right. I mean, there's no, it's almost like you can't do business with anybody, right. even if they're currently employing good practices right um so it says last week shell said that the plant would 
be in shutdown mode for a few weeks or sooner to fix flaring and water waste issues, according to the governor's statement. The company was ready to start operations already on Wednesday. Um, You know what I really don't like about this is that I was expecting that this was an old factory operation or something. And maybe they were built before laws went into effect. And so they, they were just, bypassing or exceeding things this is a brand new facility yeah yeah so they refer to it as technical niggles shell's newly minted ceo while sawan talked up some of the problems to technical niggles that startups yeah i bet typically i bet the people uh breathing in plastic or whatever definitely think this is technical niggles yeah it, it it the, the quote, though, was technical niggles that startups typically have. And the next statement is really icing on the cake. The 116-year-old company suspended ethylene and polyethylene production to make repairs and perform maintenance towards the end of March. So this thing Do you think the author wrong. thinks they're analogous to a startup then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every startup actually has a ramp up time of 116 years. So they're just now ironing out all of, you know, Shell, the gas company that fuels pretty much all of the United States and and everywhere else. Uh, It's just in startup mode. Anyway, pretty fascinating. Um, Shell's Pennsylvania petrochemical plant by the digits, uh, a $4.94 million civil penalty shell will pay pennsylvania five million an additional amount shell will pay uh, for environmental projects to benefit the local community 6.2 million for a fund allocated for projects in western pennsylvania that benefits the environment health and quality of life of the local communities there's 39 malfunction reports Uh, this actually goes quite (laughs) oh and and of course it they dragged trump into this in August 2019, the then president visited the soon to be completed Pennsylvania plant, tried to take credit for building the facility, saying that this could never happen without me and us. But Shell had actually announced plans to build the complex in 2012 during Barack Obama's term in the White House, four whole years before Trump was elected. Yeah, so smoke and mirrors and bullshit. Anyway, let's move on to the next article. Uh, The next article is over in the Late Night Geeks channel. TikTok is testing an AI chatbot called, I want to say Taco. I don't know if it's going to be called Taco, but anyway, that's where it's at. TikTok is testing an AI chatbot called Taco that can recommend videos based on what people ask it, according to screenshots of the feature shared with The Verge. So Alex Heath over at The Verge put the article together. Um, The feature could radically change search and navigation in the app. Um, This is not the first time that I have heard and I have been suggesting that Google search is dead. Because now instead of searching for just text, you can actually talk to something and in natural language and it would actually interact with you to suss out what you're actually looking for and not just give you popularity-driven results, whatever maximizes the profits in the advertising model. Um, I find it really interesting. Um, I would love for ChatGPT, you know, AI, uh, OpenAI, to actually function like this, um, where I can say, hey, give me all of the search results for this. Um, and then be able to just say it, you know, to, to, uh, you know, a smart speaker. I won't say the names because it'll probably set it off. Um, well, TikTok is testing an AI chat bot called Taco that can recommend videos based on what people ask it, according to screenshots shared with The Verge. If TikTok ends up releasing it widely, the chatbot could radically change search and navigation in the app, according to Daniel uh, Buchek of Watchful Technologies, a firm that spots these kinds of 
upcoming app changes for Fortune 500 companies. Um, seems interesting, um, but I don't necessarily want it just for videos. <laughs> but TikTok is focusing on that. Um, now, if it gets banned in the United States, who knows, but I find it really fascinating. Yeah, there's a lot up in the air right now with TikTok. Yeah. So um, Taco will display suggested, suggested prompts to help a user start a conversation with the bot, according to Buchek. Um, if I'm watching food recipes and ask for a recipe, I'll get related TikTok videos for the recipe. Or if I ask for good art exhibitions in Paris, it'll show videos alongside a list of suggestions in the answer. A prompt suggested by Taco in one screenshot says, what is the significance of King Charles III's coronation? Um, and I guess it it's providing it. I, I'm not sure why they throw that in there, but they don't actually give a... Right, it seems like in the article they need another thing, but I'm guessing the video right there has to do with the coronation. I I guess. Are you supposed to, what are you supposed to say to that? Because it looks like it's coming, the way that it's interacting, it, it says, hey, I'm Taco. Feel free to ask me anything and I'll do my best to help you find what you're looking for. I guess if you mash that, it'll send it to Taco and give you some Maybe. more information. Like, is that like a popular search when the coronation was going on or something? And so yeah. they think that people, I mean, is that kind of like when Google search suggests or at least displays other, other search ideas? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, um, there is, there's more um, at this article, but I am just going to encourage you to go over and check it out. And I've neglected to throw all three of these last articles into the chat because I am a slacker of a mayor, apparently. Bad mayor. Bad. Bad. Gosh. Let's do that. There you go. Here's all three of them. Um, and um, let's move on to the next article. We only have two articles left, it, it, including this one. Ah. So... Um, if you are uh, nesting and uh, you want to make some money, apparently this is how you do it. So in the hometown daily channel over on hometown.com, it's also the name of the show. Chirping sounds lead airport officials to bag filled with smuggled parrot eggs. The 24 bright green baby parrots chirp and bob their heads. The second anyone nears the large cages, that have been their home since hatching in March. All right, there it is. <laughs> Frida for <laughs> sorrow from the Associated Press um, wrote this article for abcnews.go.com. That's where it was aggregated from. And this says here, they have a picture of a young red Lord Amazon parrot practicing a preening behavior inside an enclosure at the Rare Species Conservatory Foundation in what? Lux, Luxachi? Luxachi? I guess. I don't know how to pronounce it. Luxahatchee? Luxahatchee, Florida. Man, I just brutalized that one. May 19th, 2023. So, pretty new. Um... Parrots live for a really long time, very expensive to raise and keep. Um, I knew somebody that had a, a gray parrot. I think it was referred to as an African gray. Um, and uh, maybe not. I don't remember. It was a gray parrot that they actually built a trust for so that when they gave it up, the person who took it would have money to continue to raise it. Um, quite fascinating. Uh, now I never saw the paperwork, so this person could be blowing smoke right up my Well, butt. I don't think so, because I was going to say that's the type of pet that people end up willing to other people, so a trust actually is a whole other level of that. 
Um, so this is pretty it's amazing. It's just because it so outlives their owners. Um, usually that's not what happens when airport officials start investigating sounds coming from a bag. <clears throat> <laughs> I wonder if they evacuated the airport while they were investigating it. Yeah, really. The Central American natives seized from a smuggler in Miami International Airport are being raised by the Rare Species Conservatory Foundation around the clock effort. That includes five hand feedings a day in a room filled with large cages. Wow, this person is going to be put in jail and debt the likes of which nobody can imagine because that's time and money that that organization has to dedicate because this doof brought in 24. So it was the hatchlings faint chirping inside a carry on bag at the Miami airport that brought them to the attention of us customs and border protection officer. The passenger, uh, Zhu Ta Wu, had just arrived on Taka Airlines flight 392 from Managua, Nicaragua um, on March 23rd and was changing flights in Miami to return home to Taiwan, according to a criminal complaint filed in the U.S. District Court of Miami or in Miami. So they stopped Wu at a checkpoint. Described as a sophisticated temperature controlled cooler. Wow. Oh, wow. So was he trying to smuggle them from Nicaragua? I don't even know if they have carrots there. Nicaragua all the way to Taiwan? Apparently. That's what it sounds like. So Wu that reached in. That must be pretty lucrative, unfortunately, to, to go through all that effort, and in addition to just the morality of it. One of the, wor- one of the birds hatched prematurely. And started chirping. Otherwise, it would have been eggs that were being transported. Oh, wow. Wow. He told the officer there were 29 eggs and that he did not have documentation to transport the uh, the birds. And then was I'm arrested. glad the birds got rescued. I mean, that was a good place for them. And they're right near the sanctuary. So a lawyer who could speak on behalf... On his behalf was not listed in the court records, but Wu told investigators through a Mandarin interpreter interpreter that a friend had paid him to travel from Taiwan to Nicaragua to pick up the eggs. He denied knowing what kind of birds they were. Yeah. Okay, but they were birds and he was smuggling them. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the key detail. So, I mean, if you're a doof, then you may not realize that they're either protected or it's illegal to transport them, you know, without documentation, et cetera. So at that point, we were off to the races. Um, Dr. Stacy McFarland said, I guess we've got all these eggs. The chicks were hatching, the incubators running. And at the time, by the time it was all said and done, we hatched 26 of the 29 eggs and 24 of the 26 chicks survived. That's probably not what would happen in nature. So this got amplified now, because <laughs> science and technology. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Jeepers. USDA regulations required the birds to be quarantined for 45 days, meaning the Rilo and his team had to scrub down when entering and leaving the room. My God. But I can imagine, you know, the the chances of bird flu or something else transiting because it's coming from a different location through the U.S. And And probably not with appropriate safeguards in between concerning the animal handling. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Insane. Okay, that's never good. Um, Anyway, so. um. Yeah, apparently it says BirdLife International lists the yellow napped um, Amazon as critically endangered with a population in the wild of between 1,000 and 2,500. The red lord Amazon is also listed as having a degree decreasing population. What were these actually then? Uh, there were two species. Um, I so think both they of were those, those two. Yeah, because this is a, a red lord Amazon up here. 
Huh. Wow. So this person was carrying endangered species and declining species, protected um, species nonetheless. 60 to 70 years or longer is what they're seeking. Um, that's how long they live, the birds, 60 to 70 years. Right. So they're looking, I mean, that's pretty incredible. They're looking for people that can take them on permanent home for the birds, which can live 60 to 70 years or longer. So, wow. Can you imagine? Can, God. I was going to say, can you imagine as a, I mean, there's so many issues in this article, but just even the, the rescuing of the parrots, like, Who's going to go, hmm, I'm age such and such. I think I need to adopt these parrots that are going to live for another 60 to 70 years. Like, that's yeah. quite the commitment to a pet. Yeah, that's why the person that I was talking about had created the fund so that the birds could be transferred to somebody else because they said that they just couldn't take care of the, the, the pet anymore. They were working too much to... Right. Wow. Okay, so let's move on to the next article and the last one for tonight. Uh, where is it? Did I overwrite this? Yeah, there we go. So um, the next article is in the hometown daily channel. Your pets produce just as much pollution as private jets, says luxury aviation company boss. This one I titled uh, in the rundown as Copium for Polluters. Um, Lux, Lux Aviation CEO told an FT summit that one of his firm's clients produced as much CO2 as three dogs per year. He was responding to criticism about the industry's environmental impact amid soaring demand. Private jets emit at least 10 times more pollutants than commercial planes per passenger per an IPS report. Yeah, you're, you're out of your mind. Um, so this is a businessinsider.com article. Wailing Tan is the author. I think that's how they pronounce their name. Um, as much as I like the idea of having leg room, I don't think that private jets are the right way to go about it. Um, even if you are a millionaire, I think a millionaire might be able to, a billionaire could probably force the industry to evolve more planes, cheaper fuel costs, cheaper licensing at the state level, because you pay to land, not you as the, well, you as the, the client pay to land but the, it's the airline that pays that fee and that's why the prices are so high and, and all of the maintenance and all of the stuff, right? We need, we basically need more competition to drive the pricing down. But again, mergers and acquisitions, it's basically the same five people owning all of the uh, airlines. Um, anyway, Patrick Hansen. And I guess they need to look at like more eco-friendly means um, of doing it yeah fueling or power you know why not make it a hybrid so that it's jet fuel that gets you up in the air and then it switches to electric because then you're just cruising on the downdraft of your wings so build it the in a different way so that you can do it that way that would be interesting huh um, it patrick would be. hansen the ceo of luxembourg based Lux Aviation, one word, Lux Aviation, I told the Financial Times Business of Luxury Summit in Monaco that one I'm of his I'm seeing a lot of luxury in this. <laughs> <laughs> or Lux, I should say. I'm, I'm sure that this person is level-headed and uh, socially conscious. I, I, I'm sure that he doesn't look at other people and go, oh, it's one of you. I'm sure he doesn't. So let me pause this video as entertaining it as it is. Um, so one of his company's customers produced just about 2.1 metric tons of carbon dioxide each year, about the same amount as what three dogs produce, according to a Wednesday report by um, the Financial Times. 
Hansen made the comment while responding to criticism about the industry's environmental impact. Lux Aviation calculated the carbon footprint of each of its 67,000 passengers in 2022 based on the direct impact of flying, excluding the carbon dioxide emissions of servers, maintenance, and other services. What are the other services? Hansen told um, Insider. So let's see here. The executive reference data from How Bad Are Bananas, a book about the carbon footprint of a broad range of activities. Um, the book authored by British professor Mike Berners-Lee states a pet dog would be responsible for 0.7 tons of carbon emissions each year. However, Berners-Lee did not seem pleased his book was being used uh, in, a re in relation to the private jet industry telling uh, the FT and inside her, they typoed their own name, um, that he was surprised and disappointed to hear data from my, quote unquote, my book, um, being used to defend the bogus eco claims made by Lux Aviation. So he said the number looked suspiciously low on the Lux Aviation side of things that the one customer produced just 2.1 tons of carbon dioxide annually okay well i mean luxembourg is a very small country so if they only flew around luxembourg maybe that number is correct yeah but takeoff is probably the most polluting i know you're trying to be funny there ai but it failed <laughs> it crashed much like a polluting plane um, so I'm really curious if anybody, you know, ran the numbers, but it doesn't look that way. They just say that private. Well, and let's remember too, they excluded sources of pollution tied to the aviation. Yeah. And it just said other things too. So yeah. What, what did it count? So even if the data was correct, it wasn't the total. It's, it's weird. It's just this weird internal bias to make this thing look like you're being eco-friendly when you're just a wingnut. I mean, uh, and that's funny because he's a pilot. I mean, uh, he owns an airline, a wingnut. Get it? He's nuts for wings. Wingnut. <laughs> it's not the same wingnut that I'm talking about. It's a wingnut wingnut. It's a wingnut wingnut. Um, so, uh, private jets emits at least 10 times more pollutants than commercial planes on a per passenger basis, according to a May, 2023 joint report by the Institute of policy, uh, studies and patriotic millionaires, a group of high net worth individuals. So it's, they're actually calling themselves out in this joint report. <laughs> That's an institute's name. <laughs> no. <laughs> I thought that was, I misread that. <laughs> um, well, it says IPS-DC.org. So uh, it must be the Institute for Policy Studies, and there is an organization called Patriotic Millionaires. Oh, I thought the Institute not, was all of that, because <laughs> the way it was worded. <laughs> not what, okay, that's okay. it. I'm going to actually open this up just so that we can see it. Yeah, it's Institute for Policy Studies. Oh, okay. Well, that's kind of disappointing. <laughs> okay, that cracks me up. That cracked me up, really. I wasn't being silly. Like, that's how, how it an... read. <laughs> the power of a comma. Um, that eats, shoots, and leaves. There you go, right? Mm -hmm. So, instant. This is an organization that needs to start up now as shirts. We should just make shirts. We should make shirts for each episode of uh, hometown daily. And this one would be, you just have it on there that says Institute for policy studies and patriotic millionaires. <laughs> uh, and the, the logo will be Scrooge McDuck swimming around in gold. Right. <laughs> well, we'd have to have an airplane somewhere on there. Oh, there you go. It will be Scrooge McDuck like this. <laughs> uh, all right.
that's it, folks. Let me bring you back to the voting page. So be sure to go over to hometown.com slash elections. You can vote on your favorite. Like I, I like all of these, so I'd be poisoning the well by voting. So I don't. I can undo my vote. Administrative law. Uh, but we always bring you back to the front page. We mash that front page. And I'm not logged in, but um, if you swipe left, you save it. If you swipe right, you forget it. And it won't be back. And then you can actually go when you log in, when you sign in or sign up to become a citizen, um, you'll have more options right here. And uh, the two options are to remember are uh, saved and um, ignored um, articles because sometimes you want to look at the ignored and go, oh, you know, with a, a different set of eyes today, I actually want to save this. Um, but it ends up in one of the two places. It doesn't go back to the general population because everything in hometown is temporal unless you save it. Um, and we actually are working on a remedy to that temporality of things um, so that it designates when a day changes from one day to the next. Um, that's actually in the works right now. And that will happen with the saved and ignored articles as well. Um, but again, you either save it or ignore it once it's on this list on the front page. Um, and um, we're working on a couple of other things um, that are going to be coming in the next few weeks. Uh, I, on the other hand, next week, I will start streaming um, six to eight hours uh, a day, talking about the news, playing games, um, and uh, just trying to um, get people to come and hang out. Because uh, an hour a day, I totally get it. It, it may not be worth your time, uh, but I hope to uh, see you here on uh, Twitch, and I will start restreaming over to youtube as well so awesome okay so end of the day i am Marwat. that is hometown.com and up there is the ai that keeps me on track you want to say good night oh great ai good night hometown citizens we'll see you tomorrow at 9 p.m eastern that's right be there or be cubicle and not eat, no, you'll be eco friendly if you attend. Bye bye. Bye bye.